and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb, and every knee will bow before Him. church and happy mother's day to all the moms grandmothers great-grandmothers and mother figures that have joined us this morning we're so thankful for the love and grace that you show your families and to the church in just a little bit pastor daniel is going to be coming to bring our mother's day message from the book of genesis uh, this morning we are going to look at rebecca the mother of jacob and esau and the legacy promises that god had for her and that he has for us but now, as we are getting ready for worship, I'd like you to go ahead and click on the This Sunday tab on the app. If needed, you can download the Canaan STL app by going to the App Store or to Google Play. On our app, you can fill out prayer requests, um, fill in a, a connection card, or go by the notes that Pastor Daniel has for us for the message this morning. And if you are watching this on YouTube, uh, you can also access all these selections by choosing the link to our website in the description below. Also, we don't want you to forget about our Wednesday night prayer time that is taking place each Wednesday at 6 p.m. as we just get together to praise God and intercede for our church and the world. 
Uh, you'll be able to join us by going through your phone or through the Zoom app by connecting through the link that we sent through an email. And lastly, we have a church business meeting that is coming up next Sunday, May 17th at 4 p.m. So please just mark your calendar for that and be watching your email for the Zoom link to be able to connect to that. And if you uh, have any questions about how to join all of these uh, virtual meetings that we're having, uh, please email us at info at canaanstl.org or you can call us at the church office at 314-487-1730. All right, we're going to begin this time of worship with prayer, so would you pray with me, please? Holy God, as we uh, come into your presence this morning, we worship and glorify your name. You are the one true God. You are Lord over all, and we praise you. We thank you that we can once again gather as the body of Christ in your presence to, to sing songs to you of worship to proclaim your, your word and your, and your name and, and just to be in your presence. And God, we also rejoice on this day as it's, it's Mother's Day, and we, we thank you and we celebrate the gift of mothers that you have given us, um, those who are biological mothers as well as those who, who are uh, adoptive mothers or spiritual mothers in our life. We just thank you for them, God, and we worship you. And we thank you for your perfect plan and your sovereignty and how, how you have all things in your hand. And now, God, as we, we come to a time of worship, we pray that your spirit would move in us. That, that even as right now, as we are at, at our different locations, at our, at our homes and not together in one place, God, that your spirit still is moving in each of our hearts and lives and where we are. And just be glorified in that. And may you be pleased and honored and worshiped with all that happens this morning. We love you, God. We give you praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's worship together. God is 
good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all our incredible moms, grandmothers, mother figures. We're just so grateful for all of you. And this is just a special day. We get to celebrate every single one of you. You know, moms are just hold such a special place in all of our lives, especially in the heart of God. And uh, there's a lot in Scripture about moms. And so today we're going to spend some time this morning just uh, looking at one mother in particular and the legacy that she leaves, a legacy of faith, a legacy based on the promises of God. So uh, excited to be able to spend Mother's Day with you. Uh, before we get to the text, I do want to encourage all of you ladies especially to go ahead and make sure that you are getting on your app and filling out your Connect card because today, uh, at the end of the service today, we will begin draw. We will be drawing three of our moms uh, to receive a special gift. So we'll announce that later this week, probably on a Facebook Live or something. So uh, we're going to be drawing today for a special gift for three of our mothers. So make sure you fill out your, uh, your online Connect card on the app and uh, make sure you get that submitted as well. So that'll be great. So today we're looking at a, at a mother who doesn't get a lot of publicity. Um, you know, through sermons and Bible studies, but her name is Rebecca. And Rebecca is the wife of Isaac. And so this is going to be in the Old Testament. So if you have your Bible, go to the book of Genesis, chapter 25, as we look at this, um, is this mother. Uh, and she's kind of controversial. You know, some, some think she, was, she played favorites too much, and, and we're going to look at some of that. But others believe that she was really just living out what she knew God had already promised. So we're going to kind of unpack this mom named Rebecca a little bit today and see what, what principles and what characteristics and qualities would be helpful to all of our mothers uh, today. So happy Mother's Day to all of you. Let's go to Genesis chapter 25 and uh, we're going to read verses 19 through 28. So Genesis 25 verse 19 it says, These are the family records of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Now Abraham fathered Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took as his wife, Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Now Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord heard his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. But the children inside her struggled with each other. And she said, Why is this happening to me? And so she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When her time came to give birth, there were indeed twins in her womb. The first one came out red-looking, covered with hair like a fur coat, and they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out, grasping Esau's heel with his hand. So he was named Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. When the boys grew up, Esau became an expert hunter, an outdoorsman. But Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Well, let's pray together. Father God, we love you. We just thank you for your, just your greatness. Lord, we thank you for just how you have set all things up for your glory and to teach us about you. We thank you for how you set up the family. And God, we thank you and praise you for the incredibly important roles mothers play. And Lord, I just thank you for the moms we have in this church. I thank you for my mom. Lord, it's just how these amazing ladies, these mothers, these mother figures just selflessly, sacrificially pour their lives, their heart, their love into the children we have, the teenagers, and even young adults. And so, Lord, I just uh, praise you for them. God, I pray as we just unpack this incredible brief historical record of Rebecca, that, Lord, uh, you would just uh, plant your word deeply in her heart, uh, bring about transformation. And God, may this message not only uh, encourage and challenge moms and ladies, but also us men and what our role is. And so, God, we just pray use this time for your purpose and glory. In Christ's name, amen. All right, well, thanks. So obviously we are, we're taking a break in our First Peter series, remember. Um, so we still have one part to go. We'll finish that up next week. Uh, so today, though, being a special day, Mother's Day, we're really just focusing on what the Bible says about moms and two moms through this historical account of Rebecca. Well, 
her faith is a big deal. So let's just look at the big thought today. The big thought is that a mother's faith plays a critical role in not only the faith of her children, but even the faith of generations to come. You know, this is a, this is a great truth. I know for, for just me personally, that the faith of my grandmother really impacted my mother, whose faith really impacted me. And now my, my wife and I, our faith is impacting our children. And so you cannot overestimate the impact that mother's faith has in her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, on down. And we're going to see that played out through the life of Rebecca. So um, let's just kind of jump right in. Look at this faithful mother named Rebecca. Number one, the first thing we see here is how much faithful moms benefit from a praying husband. So here's the historical setting. So if you go back to Genesis chapter 12, which is 13 chapters prior to this, um, God shows up into a man's life named Abraham. At, at the time, his name was Abram. God eventually changes his name. But God tells Abram he's going to bless him, that he's going to make Abram into a great nation, and that through him, the nations of the world will be blessed. Well, at this time, Abram and his wife Sarah had no children, and they were well advanced in years. We see here where uh, when, when Isaac and Rebekah have Jacob and Esau, that Isaac is 60 years old. Well, when Abraham and Sarah have Isaac, Abram is upper in his upper 90s, pushing to 100 years old, so uh, a, a lot further along. So God supernaturally acts to accomplish his promise that he gives to Abraham. And so Isaac becomes that picture of promise his entire life. He is the, he is the symbol, the visible reminder, the visible recognition that God truly does keep his word, that God fulfills his promises. And so if you go to Genesis 22, you know, Isaac is uh, probably about 10 or 11, maybe 12 years old. And, and God tells Abraham, he tests Abraham and says, go sacrifice Isaac. And so Abraham obeys. He takes Isaac up to the top of Mount Moriah, which where later King Solomon would build the temple. And he goes and begins to obey the Lord by sacrificing. But the angel of the Lord stops Abraham because he had passed the test. And so Abraham and Isaac, Isaac became that visible reminder that God is faithful to his promises. Well, no doubt, Rebecca knows this story because they're, they're distant fam family. Um, so Rebecca knows the story of Isaac, and she knows that Isaac is a symbol of this promise. So Rebecca and Isaac get married. And Rebecca, kind of like Sarah, continues to go on in her marriage without being able to to give birth to children. This, this word is childless. Some translations use the word barren. The womb has not been opened by a child. So what happens? Isaac, being a spiritual leader, being the, the son of promise, believing wholeheartedly in the covenant that God made with his father and therefore now with him, he goes to the Lord and he prays for his wife, Rebecca. It's a powerful picture of what godly, leadership looks like of what a husband should be doing for his wife. Men, we are called to pray for our wives. We are called to honor our wives, to love our wives. And you see this all throughout Scripture. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul kind of gives us some teaching on marriage. And he's really teaching about the marriage of Christ to the church, but he also uses that as a way to teach husbands and wives in the human marriage. And he says this to husbands. He says, husbands, love your wives just also, just as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her in the washing of water by the word. This shows the, the husband's responsibility. Guys, it is our calling by God to love our wives, to minister to them, to encourage them, to pray for them. And so here, Isaac gives us a great example. How much did Rebecca benefit from me and a godly mom because she had a husband who prayed for her. Guys, we cannot overestimate the role we play in our entire family. First and foremost, just our role is praying for our family, being the spiritual leaders in our family. Here, Isaac sets the tone. And as we'll see shortly after this, Rebecca is going to follow suit and she's going to go and inquire of the Lord because she has faith and confidence in God and because She's seen that modeled by her husband, Isaac. 
So faithful moms sure benefit from a praying husband. So guys, when we do our role, when we do what we're called to do as husbands and as fathers, it makes the family run so much better, so much cleaner. So there's so, so much more of a spiritual direction and spiritual climate in our families if we're doing what we're supposed to do. So just, just pray about that and think on that. How can I lead my family better? It doesn't, it doesn't be a big thing. Just, just pray for them. Pray with them. Just open up the Bible and read it together. You know, make sure your children are, are, are active in church and make sure you and your wife are part of a small group. Just those simple things you can do to make sure that your family is following Christ collectively. So, guys, we got to take that mantle and help our wives be incredible moms and wives by simply doing our part. So, let's move on to Rebecca. So, Rebecca's a lady of faith. She's a, she's a faithful mom. But just because you're a faithful mom doesn't mean you won't experience struggle. Here, Rebecca, she, she, after Isaac prays, God opens her womb and she conceives. And now she has twins. But now there's this struggle within her. And to where she goes to the Lord and the Lord tells her, two nations are in your womb. The two people will come from you and be separated. So there's this, there's this struggle. Uh, it goes back to verse 22 where the children inside her struggled with each other, right? So just because you're a faithful mom doesn't mean it, it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be a, a bed of roses. This life is filled with struggle. But it's, where, it's in those struggles where our faith is truly forged, where our faith is truly grown and exercised and practiced. And so we see this. So first we see a faithful mom's children still struggle. You, you know, you, you go throughout history, some of the most godliest women in history. I, I'm thinking like Susanna Wesley. You know, back in the early 1700s, late 1600s, she had, uh, she, she had 14 children. And she was in uh, the area of Wales in Great Britain. And she had 14 children. They lived in a small cottage there in the countryside. And um, she raised 14 children. Now, two of these children became very well known, John Wesley and Charles Wesley. John Wesley was an incredible preacher, revivalist that traveled not only Great Britain, but him and his brother Charles actually came over here to the colonies and were part of the first great awakening. They led revivals. John Wesley is credited with really starting what's become known as the Methodist Church today. Incredible, godly man um, who loved Jesus, who went around preaching the gospel. He learned that from his mom. It's said about Susanna Wesley that, you know, someone asked her one time, how do, you, how do you ever go spend time with the Lord when you're in a cottage with 14 kids? And here's what she did. And this is, this is, this is right out of the pages of history. She always wore an apron. And when she was ready to pray and spend her time with the Lord, she would pull her apron up over her head. And that's when the children knew to leave mom alone because she's been in time with the Lord. So she was very devout. But she didn't have 14 kids that went on to, to lead revival. She had two. You know, at least four of her kids ended up not even following the Lord. So just because Susanna Wesley was a godly mom, does that mean it's automatic that all your children are going to follow Christ? But we pray they do. And because of a mother's influence, it is likely that and possible that, that that happens in the Lord's graciousness. So just because of, you're a faithful mom doesn't mean your children won't struggle. Um, you know, I believe my wife is a godly lady. But my children are not angels. My children, we, we still see that sin nature in them as they fight with each other and, you know, play pranks on each other, get aggravated with each other. I mean, that's... That's just the sin nature coming out. And here's the thing. All of our children have that sin nature. We have that sin nature. That's why we need the gospel. That's why we need Christ. Because we cannot overcome that on our own. So just because you're a godly mom, godly dad, godly parents, nothing's automatic. It takes that work. It takes that diligence. It takes God working in our children's life too to bring them to faith. So, but keep on keeping on. Secondly, a faithful mom still has doubts at times. Look at, what, uh, look at what Rebecca says. Her children inside her struggled and she said, why is this happening to me? She questions. She, she doesn't understand. And she may have, may have doubted, am I, am I fit to be a mother? I mean, what mom has never, ever, never had that thought? All mothers, all dads have that thought. Man, am I even, if I'm in fit to be a dad... I know we've got some really good friends in Tennessee and 
they were with us in our church plant, and uh, they, she really wanted to have children. He didn't want to have children because he just really did not think he would be a good dad. Of course, all of us who knew him, like, you are crazy. You'd be a great dad because he's very loving, compassionate, fun, lighthearted. I just, still this day, I love this guy. He's just a great guy. But they finally had a son, and he truly is. He is a fantastic father. But he waited because he had so much doubt about what kind of father he would be. So all of us have those doubts. Rebecca has those doubts. She says, why is this happening? You know, she trusted the promise of God. She now knows that she's miraculously uh, impregnated with, with twins who are going to become, she's about to find out they're going to become two nations, but she still has her doubts. That is totally normal. I think that's another reason why the, the gift of the church is just such a blessing. Because when, when one mother or one dad is struggling and having doubts and wondering, man, I'm just, I'm just lousy at being a dad. That's when it's good for dads to get together, for moms to get together and, and discuss that and talk. You know, I just really feel like a failure today because my, my son did so and so. And it's just incredible to watch this happen where, well, that's not so bad. My kid did this, right? And, and so you start to just talk and you see that maybe, maybe I'm not the most awful parent in the world. Maybe this is just hard stuff because it is. Parenting is hard. Um, it's just really hard because you're dealing with, with little sinners who don't have the maturity or spiritual maturity to understand the nature of sin. And I mean, we're still learning that as adults, how to combat our sin through the power of the Spirit let alone our kids. So it's just hard. So hang in there, persevere. And here we, we learn from Rebecca what she does. What she does is a great example. She trusts in the Lord. So she, she has this question, why, why is this happening to me? Doubt, confusion, not understanding, questioning herself and whether or not she should be a mom. But what does she do? She seeks out the Lord. It says here, so she went to inquire of the Lord. That's a great truth. The first thing she does when she is struggling in her faith, she's struggling in her, her view, she's struggling in her, own, in her view of her own ability, she goes to the promise maker and the promise keeper. She goes to God and she inquires him. She prays. She seeks the Lord. And there's so many scripture that gives us so much hope and promise about you and I seeking the Lord. Just, just hear some. Psalm chapter 9, verse 10 says, Those who know your name trust in you because you have not abandoned those who seek you, Lord. What a great promise. Rebecca knew that. She knew that if she sought the Lord, he is never going to fail us. He's never going to abandon us. I mean, in the book of Hebrews, it, it quotes how the Lord will never leave us, never forsake us. So we have that rock solid hope. Rebecca makes a beeline to the Lord. She doesn't first go to other sources. She goes right to God first and foremost because he is the one she trusts the most. May God be the one we trust the most. Moms, may he be the one that you trust the most. When you're having a rough day, when, when things aren't going with the kids or when things aren't going well with the grandkids or if you're an aunt uh, or, you know, a, a caretaker and things aren't going with the kids, where do you go first? Go to God. Psalm 70, verse 4. So let's let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation continually say, God is great. I guarantee you that I was the source of countless hours of prayer for my mom. I know my mom had to pray so much for me. Um, during my young years, my teenage years, even my college years, times in the army. And still to this day, my mom prays for me all the time. She seeks the Lord. Let our moms seek the Lord. Psalm 106 verse 4 says, Search for the Lord and for his strength. Seek his face always. I love the concept here of strength. Our moms, you need, you need supernatural strength to be a godly mom, to continue to persevere with the effort, the energy, the, the stick to uh, the follow-through that's got to take place in biblical parenting. You need that strength from God. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him 
while he is near. Well, he is near. We have Jesus Emmanuel, God with us. So he's always near in this new covenant setting we're in. So always seek his face, call out to him. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So seek the Lord with all your heart, moms, dads too, grandparents, but seek him on behalf of your children. You know, you could read every parenting book there is, and there's still going to be those times where it just seems like nothing's working. You, can, you could teach classes on parenting and still have those moments where you're just not sure. I think God's made it that way because really to be an effective parent, it's really bigger than we are. It's a task that's larger than us. It's a, la it's a task that's more difficult that we can just simply figure out. So go to the Lord. Seek him. Because he desires us to, to recognize our need for him. To trust him. To seek him. To include him in our issues. And he will answer. That's the promise of scripture. And Rebecca knows that. And she goes to the Lord. And then... Her actions demonstrate her faith. So here's where we get a little controversial. So here God makes a very clear um, promise to Rebecca that she has two boys in her womb. And from these two boys are going to come two nations. And we see that's what happens. We see that Jacob, uh, the younger, uh, later on God changes his name to Israel and he becomes the namesake of the nation of Israel. His, his children form the 12 tribes of Israel. And then her firstborn is Esau. Well, he, he, his descendants become the nation of Edom, which is Esau's other name. Esau means hairy. Edom means red. He was red hair. So that, that, was the, that was the descendants of Esau became the nation of Edom. They were two nations. But the promise here given to Rebekah was kind of, Countercultural, because in that culture, the firstborn received the birthright, received the blessing, the inheritance, and that was it. Well, here God specifically says that the older will serve the younger, meaning that God's favor will be on the younger. That God has really chosen Jacob to be the one to carry on the covenant promise given to Abraham and then to Isaac. And we see historically that's what happened. So here, Rebecca knew that God had already ordained Jacob. So here's where we get into mystery. Uh, so we go, as, as we read on to, down to verse 28, how Isaac really loved Esau because they were both outdoorsy, liked to do things together. Jacob liked to stay at home. And so Rebecca really loved Jacob. Now, favoritism is a, is, is a sin. James talks about that. <clears throat> but here it seemed Rebecca had a special relationship with Jacob. Now, was that because she was being selfish I mean, later on we see how she and Jacob really conspired to trick Isaac to give Jacob the blessing instead of Esau. But at the same time, that's all, that was already ordained by God. So you see where we get into some mystery and some tension here. So we don't know what Rebecca's motives were. We don't know if she was being deceptive and selfish on behalf of Jacob to trick Isaac. Or some scholars say she was motivated by her faith. She knew that God had ordained this, so she was simply following what God had already said would be. So, me being the optimist, I like to choose the better, the better view for Rebecca, right? <clears throat> and even though it was deceptive how they tricked Isaac, it was God's plan for, for Jacob to be the one with the blessing. So, I like to think and to believe that Rebecca was driven by her faith. She knew God's covenant promise. She knew God had um, chosen that Jacob would be the line of promise that ultimately through which Christ himself would come. And Rebecca knew this. And so I like to believe that Rebecca was acting out on her rock solid faith in the covenant promise of God. So how does that apply to us? Our faith is not, should not be just platitudes or words that we agree with. It should be, their faith should drive and guide and direct our life. Our faith should dictate what our actions are going to be. You know, when God blesses us with, with children, when God blesses our church family with new families, with children, we've got to look at these children from the eyes of God, from the eyes of faith, 
that God's created every one of these children for a purpose. He has a plan for them. We see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, how we are all his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us before time began. None of these children are accidents. They are special. They are ordained by God for purpose. And so we're to look at them through the eyes of faith. We're to look at our children, our teenagers, um, every, every person that comes in the doors of our church family, that God has unique purpose for every single one of us. And because of our faith, that should drive our actions, how we treat each other, how we, we go above and beyond in serving and making sure they're discipled, making sure they hear the gospel, making sure they understand who they are in Christ, because that changes everything. So our faith should drive our actions. We shouldn't be acting out of the flesh just and then have a separate belief system. That's called hypocrisy, right? So James says it like this. He says, in the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. Genuine faith produces godly works in the lives of our children. That means that's loving, discipling, nurturing, caring, having much patience, right? It takes that. It's all of those things. Those are actions of faith. And so lastly, number four, we see that faithful moms leave a legacy. Faithful moms leave a legacy. So Rebecca and Isaac have Jacob and Esau. And as I've already said, later God would change Jacob's name to Israel. And uh, so Rebecca becomes the mother of the nation of Israel. And so to this day, Israel continues to be a people. The Jewish nation, the Jewish people, they can trace all of their lineage back to Rebekah, the mother of their namesake. And she left an impactful legacy. In fact, later on, Jacob marries a lady named Rachel. And Rachel becomes the mother of the 12 tribes. And so we get to Matthew chapter 2 in the New Testament. And there's this awful event that happens. Jesus has been born. He's probably about two years old or younger. And there's this very jealous king named Herod, but who's heard prophecies that, that the true king of Israel has been born. And so he's going to go out of his way to try to preserve his own reign, his own dynasty. And so he orders his soldiers to go through the, all the region of Bethlehem and that part of Judea and execute all of the two-year-old boys and younger, just to try to make sure he's eradicating this threat to his kingdom. It's awful. It's wicked. Well, a lot of you know the story. You may have read Matthew chapter 2, and you know that God shows up to Joseph in a dream, and so Joseph knows what's about to happen. He takes Mary and baby Jesus, and they flee down to Egypt, and they escape this ruthless, horrific act of King Herod. But not all the other two-year-olds are so blessed. And so Herod accomplishes his task of killing all the two-year-olds in the area. And, and when that happens, we see this little phrase here in Matthew chapter 2. It says, a voice was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel, that's the mother of the 12 tribes, the wife of Israel, Rebekah's son. Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they were no more. So we see from Rebecca, who lived about 2,000 years before Christ, her legacy was continuing. Her legacy of faith, the covenant promise that she was a part of, continued to be perpetuated from generation to generation to generation. So much so that Rachel and her families are still remembered in the times of Christ. And even to this day, even to this day, this, is, this period in Genesis is a period called the patriarchs, where you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, the four patriarchs talked about mostly in Genesis. Isaac and Rebekah are right there. For, from then and, and forevermore, people know the name of Rebekah. They know that she's a part of this covenant promise from God, that she was instrumental in making sure that God's promise continue on to her son Jacob as God had ordained. She lived that faith out and passed that faith on. Parents, it is the highest calling we have to pass our faith to our children. More important than making sure they have a good education. Making, it's more important than making sure they have sports and musical opportunities, that they have other extracurricular activities. All of that is good, but none of that is nearly as important 
is passing on her faith. Shortly after Rebecca, a few generations later, we get to the book of Judges. And the book of Judges talks about a generation. And it says, this generation had never heard the stories of God. They'd never heard about how God had taken his people out of Egypt. They'd never heard about the love and the greatness of the one true God. It says everyone did what was right in their own eyes because Israel had no king. That was a dark days. But what happened? Parents failed to pass on their faith to the next generation. They taught them other things. They taught them how to farm. They taught them how to fight. They taught them about society and culture. They taught them all those other things. But they failed to teach them what was most important about the faith in the one true God. So I've, I've got a very solid conviction. And that conviction is if your children don't grow up to be, you know, the elite of, the so, of society, but they have a rock solid faith, you've done great. If your kids grow up and, you know, have struggle to have jobs, but they have rock solid faith, you've done well. The greatest thing we pass on to our kids is faith. Everything else will be added as well. It's Matthew 6, kind of a great ending verse where Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these implied other things will be added to you as well. So parents, seek first God's kingdom in your family. Mothers, go to the Lord. Seek his face on behalf of your kids. Be intentional in passing on your faith to your children. Be, um, be that mother, like Rebecca, who lets her faith move her to action. Because I firmly believe that godly families make godly churches, and godly churches change the world. If we're not changing the world, it's because we're not being godly churches. And we're not godly churches because we're not having godly families in this whole American picture. So Canaan, we have godly families, but let's grow in that, and let's make sure that our church is godly because our family is godly and let's change this world because of godly moms and dads. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Just thank you for your goodness and grace. Lord, we thank you that um, you have raised up moms and dads in this generation who love you, who follow you, and who are intentional about passing that faith on to the next generation and beyond. Lord, I pray that right here in our congregation today, that as we are listening online, as we are gathered together virtually, that God, there are those moms in our church family now who are changing the whole trajectory of their family to leave a legacy of just rock solid faith. Lord, I pray that you would give them your strength. I pray that you give them a heart and a desire to seek you, to trust you. I pray, God, that you would stir their husbands the men in their lives, to pray for them, to seek you out on behalf of their families. And God, I pray for our children and grandchildren, that Lord, you would just bring an awakening in their generation. You would use their generation to bring an awakening in our land. Because God, we so desperately need that. Lord, there's been a lot of change in the family over the last 40, 50 years in our nation. Understanding of what that means, the value we place upon it. God, I pray that you would turn the tide and help us as a nation to, to value the family so much more than we do now. Because, God, there is so much at stake. Lord, just pray your supernatural blessing on all of them. And, God, I also pray for anyone listening right now, maybe it's a mother who's not sure she, she trusted in you yet, that, God, you would open her heart and her mind to faith, to trust you, to take a cue from Rebecca, to... To, to get to know other godly moms in her church family who can speak to her about the greatness of following you, Jesus. Because God, mothers that don't have you are missing the greatest source of power, strength, and wisdom and guidance in parenting our children as possible. You, Jesus. So Lord, I just pray that you would just work powerfully and sovereignly to accomplish your purpose in Christ's name. Amen. I want to encourage you. If you've never trusted in Christ, mom specifically, but just anyone in general, if you've never trusted in Christ, let me just urge you, plead with you to do so. 
because not only does he give you source and strength and wisdom for parenting, he forgives you of all your sin. He loves you more than you can possibly imagine. When we see God made this promise with Rebecca, it wasn't because Rebecca was so incredible that God owed her that. It was purely because of the grace of God. Grace loves. God loves Rebecca. God loves you. And God wants to give you everlasting life. He wants to forgive you. He wants you to be a part of his family. He wants to show you his glory and how powerful and mighty and loving and incredible he is. As he begin to grow you, change you, bless you, show favor to you, and then work in and through you to bless others, especially your children. So if you've never trusted in Christ, let me just urge you to just call out to him right here, right now and say, Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. I know that I have no hope of everlasting life apart from you. I know that I have no hope of anything apart from you. So Lord, forgive me. Save me. Give me that everlasting life and help me to know you more and more every single day. Because when you call out to God, he always hears. He always hears that prayer. The Bible says that a broken heart and a contrite spirit, God is yet to deny. So when you approach God in that humility, he rescues. If you have any more questions, I would love to talk to you about that. Just send me an email at info at canaanstl.org, and I will love to chat with you, pray with you, talk to you more about this incredible truth that we call the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, happy Mother's Day. Don't forget to turn in that Connect card on through the app so that you can be eligible for the drawing of uh, one of three different prizes we have for our great moms that we, that we have in our church family. God bless, love you all, and uh, we will talk to you real soon. Have a great Mother's Day. As followers of Jesus, for us, we give out of obedience and worship to God. So here at Canaan, we've established four ways for you to give. Um, one is to give online at canaanstl.org forward slash give. Another is to give through our Canaan STL app. Another way is to give in person by using our Dropbox uh, mail slot located on the west entrance over by the child check-in. And finally, you can text by texting the word GIVE to 314-648-2951 and follow the instructions that are given. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, this week. If you have been, been blessed uh, or encouraged by today's message and, and worship and know someone else that may be also, then please share this, this with them by hitting the share button below and inviting them to join us. May God be glorified through you this week. Um, hope you have a great week with him. And mothers, happy Mother's Day.